But for this morning, we've got Numbers chapter 5. Now, I told you we'd be covering two chapters, so let's just take one at a time. Numbers chapter 5, we're going to see three main divisions if you're taking notes. Number one, protecting the healthy. Protecting the healthy. Secondly, paying restitution for sin. Uh, both of these things we've seen before. We'll go over them briefly. And then there is protecting an innocent spouse in Numbers chapter 5. Okay, so let's get into this and see what we got. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, my notes start or my points start at verse 11. And that's because um, I'm just going to go over verses 1 through 10 real briefly. And I won't point out much there. But in verses 1 through 4... We see protecting the healthy, and what that's all about is it's about separating people who are sick. Um, he actually uses the word there, um, every, every leper, uh, verse 2, every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. And so, you know, these kind of uh, uh, people that would get sick from these things or be ceremonially unclean. What he says is, let's separate them. Now, You'll notice that the, the I, I said that this is all about protecting the healthy. Because some of us might get the idea that, wait, God is separating the sick people? That sounds kind of mean. Like, why, does, why would he be mean to the sick people? It's not their fault, you know, uh, they didn't mean to get leprosy or whatever. Well, it's not that God is mean or thinking, oh my goodness, let's get these gross people out of here. But what his, his main concern in this is, first of all, is to keep the healthy people healthy. He doesn't want everyone to get sick. So those few that are sick, let's isolate them to protect the healthy. And then the idea is that those people that are sick can be ministered to or they'll have time to heal uh, before being uh, welcomed back into the group. It is tough. It's, it's tough when you're sick. Um, how many of you, when you get sick at home, your parents tell you, just stay in your room? Anybody? Yeah? And they just bring your food to the door, set it on the floor like you're in prison. And they, you know, hey, your meal's out here, you know, and you got to get out of bed. You know, ah, you know. Now, some of you probably have a mom who's like, she's just, she never gets sick. It's like, it's not that, you know, her immune system is strong. She just doesn't have one. She doesn't need one. She just walks in there and, you know, whatever it is, you know, she'll just go in there and take care of you. Um, but, but, you know, generally there's that isolation. Like, okay, just stay over there, okay? And uh, here's a towel for your mouth. Don't breathe, you know? And, uh, but I'm locked in the room. I know, but don't breathe, okay? Just stay in there. And uh, we don't want to go in and through the air conditioning duct or something and getting us or whatever. That's, that's me. Like, you know, ah, get away. You know, but dad, don't you want to pray for me? Yes, from over here. Lord, bless that child, you know. Uh, get them well or whatever. But, but you know, isolation is not a bad idea. And it keeps the healthy people healthy. Okay? Now, he goes on in verses 5 through 10, uh, where we saw pain, restitution for sin. I'm going to go back just one slide so you can see these again. Protecting the healthy, verses 1 through 4. And then pain restitution for sin is in verses 5 through 10. We'll look at protecting an innocent spouse in just a moment. But in pain restitution for sin, we've seen this before in Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6, we saw pain restitution for sin. That there were times when God would say, listen, if you sin, along with the offering that you bring, you need to pay a certain portion of money to make things justice. Um, those, are, those are things that, uh, that God uh, uh, loves and desires. He wants justice from his people. He wants things to be made right. And there's a really good principle, there's just a general principle, that when you've wronged somebody when it's your fault, you ought to do your best to make that right. Bless you. You know, you, you can't go and if you've wronged somebody, you can't take it back. You've already done it, whatever it might be. But afterward, you ought to do your best to try and make it as right as you can, as right as possible. By, you know, if you've damaged somebody's goods or property, you ought to do your best to restore that, you know, whatever it was that was damaged or get it fixed or replace it, whatever it might be. Um, if you borrowed something from somebody, I do not like borrowing things because... 
um, I, I don't I don't return things. People over the years, hey, you want to borrow these DVDs of you know this you know this Bible study or whatever? No, I do not, because you'll never see it again. Because I'll get it, and it'll get uh, it gets my house, and I may or may not watch it, and and then it may end up in my garage, or I might one day be going to the you know Goodwill or something. It's like what is I don't remember. I don't know. I'll just give it away, you know, and and uh, you know you know. But, but you ought to do your best to make things right if you've wronged somebody. Now, what we'll do is we'll pick it up at verse 11. There we are, verses 11 through 31, protecting an innocent spouse. What is this all about? This is a, this is a fascinating and bizarre um, uh, account here. Some specific instructions that are given, and uh, it's, it's so fascinating, and it's bizarre, at least to me it is. I, I think it probably will be to you, too. We've never heard anything like this. But let's, let's see what God does here. Verse 11, protecting an innocent spouse. Now, verses 11 through 14, what he's going to start with is suspicion. Okay? Sus. Verse 11, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel. And say to them, if any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him. Unfaithfully toward him? What is, he, what is he talking about? Verse 13, and a man lies with her carnally. So what he's saying is in the case of adultery. Okay? Verse 13, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband. Her husband doesn't know about it. And it is concealed that she has defiled herself. She's made herself unclean by being with another man. And there was no witness against her, nor was she caught. If the spirit of jealousy comes upon him, comes upon who? If the spirit of jealousy comes upon her husband, Maybe he suspects something. He's suspicious. Maybe this is something that God puts on his heart. So this jealousy is stirred up. Look what happens. Verse 14, if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him. Now, at this point, he doesn't even know. He doesn't know what she's done. It's hidden. There were no witnesses. No one knows. Just his wife and the other man. But if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, look at the phrase at the end of verse 14, although she has not defiled herself. Now maybe he's jealous and he thinks, I think you've been with someone else, but he has no proof. Maybe she has. However, he also says, maybe she hasn't defiled herself. Maybe she's not gone and been with another man. Verse 15, Then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her. He tells us what that is. One-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it because it is a grain offering of jealousy, an offering for remembering for bringing iniquity to remembrance. Yikes. So I'm suspicious of you, and you need to go with me to the priest, and we're going to take this offering of suspicion. We're going to take this offering of jealousy, and we're going to find out if you've sinned. That's, that's scary. If you've sinned, if you haven't sinned, not scary. And the priest in verse 16 shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen, bless you, in an earthen vessel. Where do you get holy water from? Where do you get holy water from? You take regular water, and then you cut the center of it out. And then, I'm just kidding. Holy water is something that is <laughs> determined by the priest. He would bring water. It's not any different from anything else, but he determines and and blesses that water and says, okay, this is holy water that we're using. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel. <laughs> I'm pretty funny, huh? Yeah. On a Sunday morning. I think I am. 
<laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Verse 17. The priest shall take holy water. In... I'm sorry. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel. That means like a, a clay vessel. So he's got some water in an earthen vessel. And take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. I told you this is bizarre. What? Scoop up some. He's got, the, he's got his clay pot. He's got his water in there. He takes, he gathers up some dust from the floor of the tabernacle. Gets it? Pours it in the pot. Okay, where are we going with this? Verse 18. Then the priest shall stand the woman before the Lord. Uncover the woman's head, because her head would have been covered customarily. It's what they did. He would uncover her head and put the offering for remembering in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. So she's holding that. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. Why is it bitter? Because he took some dust and put it in there. Who wants to drink that? And the priest, in verse 19, shall put her under oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray to uncleanness, while under your husband's authority, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. But, in verse 20, if you have gone astray while under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself, and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse, and he shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people, when the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. What? Your thigh rot and your belly swell? What is going on? Verse 22. And may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. Wait a minute. What? So this is the ceremony that God is prescribing. If the man is jealous and he thinks that his wife has been with someone else, he's to take his wife to the tabernacle, present her to the priest. The priest takes a clay pot filled with water, gets some dust, puts it in there. I don't know how much. I don't suspect that he made it muddy, but just put some in there. Um, what, what would happen is the woman would drink this water. If she was guilty and no one knew before that, what would happen is it would mess up her stomach and it would swell her stomach and cause her thigh to rot. I told you. Bizarre strange. What a strange thing. Okay? We move on. At the end of verse 22, then the woman shall say, Amen, so be it. Then the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water. And he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And the water that brings the curse shall enter her to become bitter. Oh, what did I do? Oh, sorry about that. Um, verse 25. Then the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, shall wave the offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering as its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter. and Her belly will swell. Her thigh will rot. And the woman will become a curse among her but if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. This is the law of jealousy when a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself. Or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand uh, the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute all this upon her. Then the man shall be free from iniquity, but that woman shall bear her guilt. What a strange, strange thing. Do you guys agree? Strange? Yes? No? Yeah. 
a strange thing. And, and why? Now, now, here's another fascinating thing, at least for me. When I'm going through and I'm, I'm looking at these, uh, as I'm studying these things, I'm thinking, why? Did anybody else think, wonder why? Why, why this way? Uh, why do it this way? Why not use a candle? Why not use some kind of animal? Why not do, you know, use something else to determine this? And at this point, I do not know. I do not know. I do not know why God chose to do it this way. But at the beginning of this, uh, this um, uh, prescribed way of determining this, this you know, whether the, the husband's jealousy was, was real or not or validated or not, it, it, this is God giving these instructions. This is what I want you to do. Do it this way. What a strange thing. And uh, oftentimes we will find ourselves, you will find yourself, I have found myself over these many years of being saved, that God does things that I do not understand. What a surprise. You will be uh, much happier if you will determine in your mind and in your heart right now that there are times when God does things that I do not understand, and that's okay. He's God. He may do things that seem so strange to me. Why would he do it that way? I wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't cause her belly to swell and her thigh to rot. Why would he do it that way? Well, he does it the way that he wants to do it because that's, that's how he wants to do it. He's God. And if I will, will determine that in my own mind and in my own heart to say, you know what, sometimes God is going to do things. And for me, it's often he does things a different way than I would do it. But he always works it out uh, for the best. It's, God's way is always the best. Now, I told you that this is protection for, for uh, protecting an innocent spouse. And there's Something else, I, at verse 15, one other sub-point that I forgot to put in, there's the suspicion, and there, then there is the submitting to a test, and that was the test there. But I told you, listen, this is protection, protecting an innocent spouse. Um, some of us may look at this and go, wait a minute, why does the woman have to, you know, do this thing, and why not the man, and why does she have to drink bitter water and dust and, you know, do all of these things, and why not the man? You and I need to understand that we often, well, not oftentimes, when we read the Bible, most often we're looking at it through our 2022 American eyes. And we do not understand oftentimes uh, the culture at that time, that ancient culture at that time. And, and actually the culture um, is still this way in many parts of the world. Where the woman is to be submitted to the man this way and he's the head. Although oftentimes... The man uh, would uh, uh, abuse his authority over the wife and not treat her uh, uh, properly and appropriately. And God is, in fact, uh, uh, teaching um, uh, 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 his people how to treat one another, even in this, believe it or not. Because you see, if this law was, if this test wasn't in place, if God didn't put this, this, this test in place, what the man might do is, I'm jealous, I think you've cheated on me, and I'm going to have your life, I'm, I'm killing you, I'm getting rid of you. And so he might have the right to just take her life, to destroy her. But instead what God does is he sets this up, as strange as it might seem, seem of the, the, the way of doing it, he sets this up so that if the man has been offended by his wife, then there is justice for the husband. But if the wife is innocent, she goes through this test, and she will be determined to be innocent. So that the man can't just decide, hey, you know, back in that culture, uh, you know what, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm jealous uh, of, of you, and you know what, I don't, I'm suspicious, and, and I'm, uh, that's it, you're done, I'm taking your life. Um, Even today, we see that, I mean, you can be getting off the freeway. I don't really see them getting off the freeway here in, in Menifee, but uh, sometimes there's places where you can be exiting the freeway, and there'll be these little bright signs, and it'll say, it'll say simply, fast divorce, with a phone number. 
That's it. Or maybe there's a website. That's it. It's, it's you know what, uh, I don't like you anymore, let's just get a divorce tomorrow. Boom, done. And if we're doing it today, you better believe that they were doing the same thing back then. Yeah, it was ancient, uh, uh, you know, society. And, well, I thought they were more, you know, uh, holy or, you know, I, I thought that they were more, you know, well-behaved. Listen, people have always been people, sinful. And even back then, they could just decide that, you know what, uh, this wife, uh, I don't like her anymore. Why not? She burnt my tortillas. I'm divorcing her. Boom. And so what God is trying to prevent here in this is that, you know, the innocent party is, um, you know, is violated. Whether it be the man being innocent because his wife went off and did something, or whether it be the woman who's innocent, just because the man is, is jealous, he can't just decide, well, I'm just going to get rid of her. He's got to go through this test. Now, we move on into Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Let's see if we've got... Um, we're going to see rules for the Nazarite, and then we are going to see at the bottom receiving God's blessing. Now, rules for the Nazarite, we're going to read through this because Nazarite comes up quite often in the Bible. And what is the Nazarite? Anyways, what is, what is, what is, what is this? Verse 1 of Numbers chapter 6, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, bless you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or woman, a man or a woman could do this, consecrates. Anybody know what consecrates means? Last week, second service, they didn't know what consecrate means. Does anybody here know what consecrate means? To make holy? Yes. Anybody? Okay, yes. To separate themselves. Same thing. Make themselves holy by setting themselves apart. He says here in verse 2, whether uh, when either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. So a man or a woman could do this. Let me get some specifics here, okay? Let's look at this. The first thing is, first thing is, ah, oh, that's, we'll get to that in a few minutes. I'm sorry. Verse 3, the first thing is no alcohol. Verse 3, he shall separate, he or she, so, shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice, that's a bummer, nor eat fresh grapes or even raisins. Wow. Verse 4. All the days of his separation... He shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. Must avoid it at all costs. Okay? Then there is, verses five, verse 5, not only no alcohol, but no haircuts. Verse 5. Summertime, right? There's no haircuts in the summer. Just let it go. Wait till school starts. Verse 5, all the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So hippie time, right? Trippy hippie makes this vow to the Lord. You'll notice that it is temporary in verse 5. Until the days are fulfilled. So this is a vow that he or she would make for a set amount of time. And during that time, no alcohol and no haircuts. Going natural. Okay? Verses 6 through 8, no dead bodies. You're like, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. Verse 6, all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. And all of us are, yeah, I... That's okay with me. However, verse 7, he shall not make himself unclean. So he can't go near a dead body, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation he shall be holy to the Lord. It just got real serious. 
because this individual, man or woman, who separates themselves to the Lord and says, you know what, uh, I am going to make this vow for a year or for six months or whatever it was. If one of his loved ones died within that time while he or she was, uh, had taken the vow of a Nazarite, he or she was not allowed to touch the, the, the dead body of their loved one. They couldn't be near it. They couldn't handle it. What a sad, sad thing. But God is saying, if you take this vow serious, and you're not to break this vow, it's a promise that you're making to the Lord. Now, what he does in verses 9 through 12, God understands. This is where uh, I put up my sub points. Sorry about that. In case of defilement, look at this in verse 9. And if anyone dies very suddenly beside him, I mean, that, that is a... That is a, 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 a possibility. Maybe he's, this, this, uh, uh, he's taking the vow of a Nazarite, he or she, and they're standing next to their dad, hanging out, and their dad has a heart attack or something happens, an uh, um, uh, aneurysm or something, and the dad dies and falls over on this individual. What am I supposed to do about that? Verse 9. If anyone dies very suddenly beside him and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing, Seventh day, he shall shave it. Okay? Then on the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned in regard to the corpse. And he shall sanctify his head that same day. He shall consecrate to the Lord the days of his separation and bring a male lamb in its first year as a trespass offering. But the former days shall be lost because his separation was defiled. In other words, here's the way. If, if, you, if something happens to you, and man, it wasn't my fault. I didn't know he or she was going to die and they just landed on me. What am I supposed to do? Ceremonially unclean. God says there's a way to fix that. I like that. That God always makes a way out. God always makes a way out. That if we will trust him in the situation, God will make a way out. God doesn't say, oh, forget it. Nothing you can do about it. Don't ever come and give, you know, make another vow to me again. He doesn't do that. He makes a way for this person to be right once again. All of us at one time or another have struggled with sin and the guilt of that sin. And we talked about this before, that there are times when you feel like, you know what, God's mad at me. I did something bad. And I just don't think there's any going back from it. I don't think, I don't think there's anything I can do. You need to understand. You and I need to understand that if we confess our sins, he is what? Anybody? Thank you very much. You gave me the whole portion. I love it. He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Brand new start. Okay? Verse 13. What about when the vow is fulfilled? Okay? Now, this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and he shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering. One ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering. One ram without blemish as a peace offering. A basket of unleavened bread. Cakes of fine flour mixed with oil. All of this sounds so good to me. Unleavened wafers anointed with oil and the grain offering with their drink offerings. We've read through, studied through all those offerings before back in Leviticus. Verse 16. Then the priest shall bring them before the Lord and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall also offer its grain offering and its drink offering. Verse 18, Then the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the door of the tabernacle of me, and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. So he's to offer that hair. And the priest shall take the boiled shoulder of the ram 
one unleavened cake from the basket and one unleavened wafer and put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated hair. And the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. They are holy for the priest together with the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. Party! Woo! This is the law of the Nazarite who vows to the Lord the offering for a separation. And besides that, whatever else his hand is able to provide, according to the vow which he takes, so he must do according to the law of the separation. Wow, okay. Let me ask you a question. What is a Nazarite? It never said, did it? Isn't that strange? If he takes the vow of a Nazarite, then we go, what is a Nazarite? All these questions that we have, and sometimes when we're in the scriptures, we're looking at it like, okay, it's a vow of a Nazarite, but what is, you know, what is this? Again, there are things as we're reading through, maybe you and I will find out together later on, oh, this is what a Nazarite is. Now, Nazarite, Nazareth, you know, what are we getting at here? Now, let's... Let's go ahead and finish up here. Receiving God's blessing. Verses 23 through 27. This is where we finish. Look at this. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying. Who's speaking? Verse 22. Let me read it for you one more time. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Who's speaking? The Lord is speaking. Right? And he's speaking to Moses. And this is what he says in verse 23. Speak to Aaron and his sons. Now, uh, those of you that have been here, who, Aaron and his sons, what position or title do they hold? The priests. The priests. Thank you very much. So he says, speak to the priests. This is what you're to say in verse 23. This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them. Now remember I told you at the beginning that we learn things from our fathers, all of us, whether you've got a good dad or a bad dad, whether your dad is present or whether he's absent, you learn things from him. We learn things from our parents, our moms, people that are older than us. We even learn how to speak, right? We all know how to speak because we started speaking when we were really, really young, still at home. And we heard mom or dad or maybe older siblings or whoever else was there in the home. We heard them speaking and then we began to form words. You ever thought about that before? Like if, if you had a baby and you just had the baby there and never spoke to the baby, would the baby ever learn how to speak? No. If the baby never heard anybody else speak, um, why would the baby even you know form words or say anything? There's no reason to. And, and so think about that. Everything that we are, are saying, the way that we communicate with one another, we've learned from someone older than us. Sometimes somebody uh, same age or younger or whatever, but you get the idea that we've learned how to speak. Well, God here is teaching his people how to speak. It is always so funny. You've seen videos. You probably have stories yourself or your parents might have stories of things at your home that were discussed between family members that were never meant to be heard by anyone else. And then you, as a little bratty little kid, went to the store and you saw, you know, some elderly lady or you saw some, you know, person or whatever and you said something that you weren't supposed to say. And your parents were so embarrassed, so embarrassed. All children alarm their parents, if only because you are forever expecting to encounter yourself. That's how it is for a parent. You have kids, and you realize right away, they say everything that you say. They do everything that you do. And then all of a sudden, you realize as a parent, oh my goodness, you know, they're learning from me. They're learning all of my bad habits. And I don't know what it is about kids, but, you know, you have bad ha habits as a parent, and those are the first things that they do when they get outside the home around other people. 
They, they, they do your bad habits or say the things that you, you ought not be saying. Here, God is teaching his people how to speak. And here's what he tells them. This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, in verse 24, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Here's what's supposed to happen. The priest, the priests, are supposed to bless the people this way. What do you mean bless the people? Well, they are to pronounce this blessing on the people by saying the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. These are all good things. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. These are all wonderful things. Wonderful things. I want you to notice something. Well, let's let's read verse 27. So they shall, this is God speaking, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. This is extraordinary here as we finish up. Because in verse 27, what God determines is, is if you priests will pronounce this blessing over the people the way that I'm telling you to do it, two things are going to happen. Number one, they'll have my name on them. God. They'll have God's name on them through this pronouncement. Through, through pronouncing this blessing over the people, they will have God's name on them. What does that mean? You mean a tattoo? Does that mean what are you talking about? No, it just means that they will be recognized as God's people. But the second thing is, God says, I will in fact bless them. Listen, look at that again. Verse 24, the priest says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord pronounces all of these things. Let me ask you a question, okay? The priests are to bless the people this way. In response to that, God puts his name or his ownership on the people. They belong, they're his special people. And he blesses them. Okay? In this scenario, what do the people do? What is their responsibility here? Does anybody know? Anybody see it there? That's right. God's blessing on the people was, it came through the priest. The priest had to pronounce this blessing on the people. But what if the people are not all good? What if the people were mean to each other? What if the people were fighting that day when the priest pronounced this blessing? That is besides the point. God was going to put his ownership on the people and bless them, do all of these things, as long as the priests, by faith, pronounce this blessing on the people. All the people had to do was stand there and receive. What a deal. What a deal. Isn't that incredible? They would receive his name. It would belong to God and they would receive his blessing simply by standing there listening and receiving what the, what the priest was saying. Now this is incredible because what God does, a couple things going on here as we finish, and i got to tie this up real quick here. A couple things going on. First of all, God tells his people, he tells them how to be blessed. Do this, and you'll get blessed. Nothing has changed there. God still tells us how to be blessed. Still. It's real simple. Do what God tells you to do, and you'll be blessed. And yet we as a people, just in general, speaking in general, we still, we don't want to do what God tells us to do. I don't need your blessing. I'll bless myself. I'll do what I want to do. 
But God is telling very plainly, very simply, if you do this, you'll be blessed. It's just like a father telling his little kid, his little son or his little daughter, listen, if you do this, everything will be good. Everything will be right. It's real simple. If you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to be fine. And yet, oftentimes, we get, uh, you know, uh, maybe suspicious of, you know, our parents or our dads or whatever. Or we think, ah, you know what? You're an old guy. You were born when you were 50 years old. You don't really know. And I'll just do my own thing. And then we want to do our own thing. And, and then we find out that, ah, that uh, just that didn't turn out right. Or even worse, we do it on our own, and it does turn out right. And then we start thinking, you know, he or she, they, they don't really know anything. I'm just going to do things on my own from now on. It's real simple here. God says, listen, if, if the priests will do this, then the people will be blessed. It's incredible. What an incredible deal. God still operates this way. He still operates this way. He, through the work of the great high priest, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that our great high priest is Jesus. That through our great high priest, his obedience to the Father, you and I could be saved. What? Well, what do I have to do? There's nothing you can do. You can't save yourself. You cannot earn heaven. You cannot merit eternal life. You cannot. It comes through the high priest. As long as the priest does what he's supposed to do, Jesus was the priest. He did what he was supposed to do. And he made salvation possible for us. He saved us. So then what happens is you and I we just receive it. That's it. Just receive it. Just like these people. All they got to do is receive it. What the priest did, great. Pour it on me. And through that work of the priest, the obedience that they that they showed to the Father, then, then the Father would bless the people. Same thing, same pattern today. We get saved through Jesus, our priest, his obedience to the Father. What do we do? Nothing. We just receive it. It's a gift, right? Isn't it a gift? What do you do, what do, you do with a gift? You just receive it. I'm going to be telling you this, I'm going to be saying this all day long, but we're a little more than halfway to Christmas, my favorite time of year. Gifts. If you've been here for 10 minutes, you know that I talk about Christmas too much. What a gift. When somebody gives you a gift at Christmas, did you earn it? No. You with your bad attitude and disobedience, no, you did not earn that gift. You know that you've got a pile of gifts there that you do not deserve somebody gives you, what do you do? You just receive it. That's it. Just receive it. Same thing with Jesus. He already did the work of dying on the cross, paying for our sin. So what do we do? We simply receive his payment for sin. He paid for my sins. I simply receive that by faith. And what do I receive in return? Salvation. Not a work. It's just me saying, yeah, I believe that what Jesus did paid for my sin. Incredible. And so, Father, we thank you so much for this morning.